But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello everybody, welcome back to The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. At this point, as of this recording, there is one last round of 32, third round match going on. Yeah, we're cheating a little bit. We're recording uh, on Saturday and we'll probably release the episode on Sunday. But thank you, All England Club, for continuing your tradition of no tennis on Sunday. It gives us a nice break. Uh, the fifth set between Chilic and Medvedev has just started, and this does not look good for Marin Chilic. Before we get into that, uh, welcome to our Wimbledon mid-slam recap. We're going to skip the dawdling because there's so much to get through. I don't even know where to start. Yeah, are we telling the truth this time? We always say that and then we dawdle nonetheless. Well, there, there are you dawdling. A lot of things have happened in the first week of Wimbledon. It'll make for, I think it will help with the pace of the episode because we can just kind of bullet point our way through. And I'd say there there were more upsets on the women's side than on the men's side. Yeah, and some of these we, we talked about the possibility of when we did the draw analysis, and others were a bit out of left field. One that I think people saw was a possibility was Sloan beating Petra Kvitova in the first round. I don't know that I called it. But it's not... You didn't call it. It was no. more like, well, don't look past slow. Right. It's not entirely shocking, but it is still... I mean, Petra is a two-time Wimbledon champion. It's a draw right? buster, is what it mm-hmm. is. Sloan beat her 6-3, 6-4 straight sets before going on to lose to Samsonova in the third round. One of almost a handful of women who have parlayed their warm-up prowess into second-week runs at Wimbledon. Right. And the way Samsonova is winning these matches, for some people, she feels unbeatable, (laughs) you know, and a lot of players do look like that in the first week and then they're beaten, of course, but she beat Pagula before taking out Sloane Stephens. She's in really as good a form as anyone at the moment. Kennan lost to Brengel in uh, 45 minutes and she hit 41 errors and there was a lot of talk about this match. The The loss was so quick and looked so bad that uh, Ben Rothenberg cre- created a stat to explain what happened and just how bad it was. Mm-hmm. And it was the rate of unforced errors. Mm-hmm. Meaning Based how on... many errors per minute yeah. she hit. It was almost one per minute. 41 errors over 45 minutes. Uh, how does this happen? I mean, you could almost see it if she were a huge ball basher. Like sometimes when Sabalenka goes haywire, you see a huge number of errors. But what the hell? Well, how it happens is that she's one of the fastest players on tour. She doesn't often take a lot of time between points. And once that train is off the rails, it just, it's crashing downhill. Yeah. Brengel is a very, she's a very annoying player if you're not playing well. But this have to say, in this fashion, was unforeseen. Look, she's been going through a lot of ups and downs in the last year or so. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is an unfortunate down for her. But for me, the more, the most surprising part of this result, given the context that we were made aware of, just how bad it was, she still won six games. Right. You lose in 45 <laughs> minutes, you hit 41 errors, you play this historically bad match but you still win six games like mm-hmm. that's crazy there wasn't a double bagel no i mean a function of grass and how quickly things go on grass and how quickly Kenin herself plays but still bianca andreescu lost to alizé cornet on the first day six two six one cornet mm-hmm. who's had a bunch of success at this tournament but who then went on to lose in the next round right andreescu looks uh out of sorts at the moment mm-hmm. at the very least she was able to play a bunch of tournaments without injury. So that is one positive she can take from this experience. Svitolina loses in the second round to Magda Lynette. And uh, Belinda Bencic 
loses in the first round to Kaya Yuvan. Yeah, you tweeted something about this because we are still sort of trolling Benchic for her comments on Naomi uh, craving attention or needing to be in the talk, as she said. Mm-hmm. I think you underestimated the uh, disdain for Benchich around the internet. Mm. Well, I, th- I think because it had happened a few years ago, that loss, that that's, I think it was a semifinal win over Serena at the Rogers Cup, planted the seed for this to happen all these years <laughs> later. Right. And uh, I remember watching that and feeling annoyed by it, but it wasn't at her. It was because, you know, the Rogers Cup set off fireworks. And Drake was there too. And Drake was there. Yeah. So I felt maybe she took a little too much flack. But there apparently there are a number of people on tennis Twitter who don't feel kindly to her. Mm-hmm. Victoria Azarenka lost to Sorana Kirstea in the third round. Heading into this tournament, I had said on the last episode, watch out for Vika and how her injury situation holds up at mm-hmm. this tournament. And she looked, for the most part, fine physically. But you might say mentally, she kind of fell apart in that third set against Kirstea. To Kirstea's credit, if you are somebody who feels generous enough to give her any credit for anything in tennis or life, she played well. Yeah, yeah. But Vika, man, like I mean, those double faults. Vika mentally really just lost it in that third set. It, you know, it, it really looked way more psychological than physical. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big, the first big upset of the tournament was Francis Tiafo beating Stefano Tsitsipas in straight sets. I feel like we, since we are wrong so frequently, we have to take a little bit of credit, or you have to take some credit for uh, giving Francis a really good chance in this match. Mm-hmm. And he came out with a plan, played so professionally, returned a hell of a lot better than Stefanos, and. It was just so cool to watch. And it really felt like Francis was putting something together. Taking credit for calling that doesn't really mean much to me because I feel like the signs <laughs> were there mm-hmm. as Medvedev is up to love in the fifth set. Oh, dear. Tsitsipas may be a little hungover from the Roland Garros final. Uh, he didn't play any tournaments before Wimbledon on grass. And his grandmother had just died. Yeah, that too. It feels like a long time ago, but it's not. And honestly, his return game is just not there yet for grass. It, it's exposed too much right now. The majority of the top 10 seeds remained through to the fourth round on the men's side. Some of the earlier upsets, if you can call them that, Kasper Ruud definitely was playing well, especially on clay mm-hmm. heading into this tournament. Karen Busta, who made the semis the week prior, Diminar, who won a title, and Yannick Sinner, not necessarily for his grass prowess that he brought to this tournament, but a cachet, name recognition, yeah, yeah, a buzz. Boris Becker said on TV today that he spoke with Yannick, and Yannick told him, allegedly, that he's just not figured out how to play on grass yet. So you mean to tell me you were watching a tennis broadcast that Boris Becker was mm-hmm. on and you stayed on yeah, that channel long was... enough to take in this information? There was no choice. Because it the was other the day, only feed available. The other day you almost fell off the exercise bike trying to <laughs> trying to reach for the remote yes. to change it as soon as you heard Becker on the call, only to change to the same match on another channel to get John McEnroe. The McEnroe. And Both. Patrick McEnroe, yeah. No, today this was the curios Oje Aliasim match, and Becker and Andrew Castle were the only feed I could find. And I just kind of had to suffer through it, because I don't want to sit there in silence. Mm. Especially during a curios match. There were upsets, there were also some surprises. For me, Christian Garin is one of the surprises of this tournament, making the fourth round. Uh, he hasn't had a very difficult run. Pedro Martinez got rid of uh, Mofis for him, and so Garin beat Martinez in the third round, and he'll now face Djokovic in the fourth. Good luck to that man. <laughs> right. Ivashka and Urkacz also quietly slid into the round of 16. Ivashka, it, it's nice to see this because he has put together a stellar year for him. Uh, he took a set from Nadal on clay. Wait, hold on. You're, you're saying that a stellar year includes winning one set on clay? 
Uh, that's not all. Hold on. <laughs> there, were there not commas? I'm just saying. It was the first thing you no, said. No, I mean, he has really been gearing up and he's been okay. playing well. He gave Federer a good fight at Halle. He beat Zverev at Munich, which, okay, there's a if win. you'll recall, is his fucking court. Mm. And I quote, just saying. Okay. Great to see uh, a really good result here from Ivashka. And or- Orkac is just kind of doing his business quietly and efficiently over there. Well, he's had a bit of a dip in recent months since we winning Miami. No, I mean only here. No, well, yeah. this tournament. No, I know. I'm yeah, just yeah. saying it's nice to see him reemerge after, you know. Mm-hmm. We've also seen uh, quite a few people who've done well at Roland Garros play well at Wimbledon as well. Coco Gauff is into the second week of both tournaments. On the women's side, you've got Rybakina following up her quarterfinal at Roland Garros. Now she's in the fourth round here. Krejcikova is also in the fourth round. Sviantek. I kind of quipped, joked on the preview episode that what exactly is Taylor Fritz going to be doing at this tournament, given that he had just had knee surgery. Right. At, at first it was like, why is he playing at all? And then... He gets through two long matches, one three hours, one almost four hours, in the first two rounds. And it's like, okay, he just had meniscus surgery three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And he decided to play. And he cut off his hair, his strength, his Samsonian power. (laughs) Yeah. It, It looked like in a hotel room by himself, you know, with a young woman. And he then goes on in the third round to take the opening set from He Who Shall Not Be Named Mm -hmm. with the last letter of the alphabet. Marton Fucevic beat both Yannick Sinner and Diego Schwartzman en route to the round of 16. This is the fourth time that he's been in the fourth round, but never advancing to the quarterfinals. And guess who he will play next? Andrei Rublev. This will be the fifth time they've played just this year, and... Fujovic has not won any of those yet. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is a good time to take him out for <laughs> Fujovic. Right. This would be a good time to turn the tide. Rublev isn't as consistent as he's been over, you know, mm-hmm. the prior year and a half. Like during the fall and winter. And I think the, the surface works better for this matchup. Yeah, definitely. In, in Fujovic's favor. Karen Hachanov. Yeah, uh, I did not see Who's this kind coming. of been languishing. I thought that was... I mean, a pretty good matchup for Tiafo given the way he was playing. Mm-hmm. And Francis, I don't know, didn't didn't really seem to show up for the match. Uh, Hachanov kind of routined him in this one. The surprise here wasn't so much that Hachanov beat Tiafo, was it's that Hachanov is here to begin with. Right, right. The for least... me, he, for me, he stalled in his career. I'm shocked to learn that he's 25 years old already. It feels mm-hmm. like he's younger, even though he looks like he's been 30 for 10 years. And for somebody who had so much promise earlier on in his career, he hasn't really delivered. He's made one slam quarterfinal. I believe that was at the French Open a couple of years ago. But he was the first of this Russian generation to really break out, winning the Paris Masters, uh, must have been three years ago. And and since then, it's like we're, we're kind of waiting for the next step for him, and he's regressed a bit. Mm-hmm. And given the momentum that Tiafo had, I was surprised that the match wasn't more competitive. So where we are in this tournament is Sunday is the day off. Monday is when all these round of 16 matches will commence. On the women's side, Barty will play Krejcikova. The most recent and the third most recent Roland Garros champions. Spoken more simply, they've won two of the last three French Opens. <laughs> yes. I struggled to get that out. You don't want to know how many times this little bit has been edited <laughs> because of how he struggled to describe this. It is not my fault that Roland Garros was held in the fall last year. It's very confusing. Very mm-hmm. easy to forget. Critique of a man, like she busted through at the French Open and quietly here at SW19 going about her business. She actually could have faced her doubles partner, Siniakova, in this round, but Barty took her out in straight sets. Not straightforward, but they were straight sets. It was straightforward for a set and a half before Mm. it got a little bit more complicated for Miss Barty. And often, she complicates stuff herself, Mm -hmm. which is a worrying thing. That said, she's the top seed, 
she was expected to maybe have more success on grass than clay. That's not how her career arc turned out. I mean, nothing about her career has been particularly uh, normal. <laughs> right. You know, so. But she has won titles on grass. She is very suited to the surface. Mm -hmm. It was just surprising that she won on clay first at Roland Garros. Her form isn't stellar at the moment, but she's improving. Next up, Raducanu versus Tomlanovic in a very surprising round of 16 matchup that could have been Ostapenko, could have been Kirstea, could have well, been could Vika. Have been, it could have been Ostapenko had she played even 50% of what she's capable right. of. If she had paid, played like 52%. She, she definitely <laughs> would have beaten Tomlanovic. So she said, Raducanu is a British wild card, and it's... I mean, she's become a fan favorite during this first week. It's always great for players to make good on their local wild cards. We didn't we didn't say this during that little surprises section, but this is the surprise of the tournament. Yeah, yeah. And how easily she's winning these matches as well. Like this is this is crazy. In the next match, another player who is sort of quietly just doing her job, Paula Badosa, is in the fourth round versus Mukova. Coco Goff. Has been making her way through the draw pretty easily. Will face Angelique Kerber in the fourth round. That was once supposed to be the uh, Serena Williams slash Angie Kerber spot. Mm -hmm. We don't know, you know, if that match had happened, who knows where we'd be. Well, that would have been, but the, it match, did not. That would have been the match prior. Yes. That would have been the third round match to get to Goff. Coco is at this point of her career now where she's no longer struggling through these three set matches. It's no longer... A whole lot of drama, unnecessary, extended matches. She's figured something out. Mm -hmm. uh, her success on clay must have done her really good because there's there's really just no fuss going on right now at Wimbledon for her. She's beating the people she's supposed to be beating. Angelique Kerber looks resurgent, rejuvenated, reassured. Yeah. She's re-emerged. <laughs> I was a bit worried because uh, the Sorry Bros Tormo match was very tough and Angie was holding her wrist a lot. Like mm -hmm. she looked to be in a lot of pain uh, with her left wrist, which is her playing arm. And I was hoping this wasn't... Oh, look at you. You See? remembered a lefty I know. being wow. a lefty. Somebody I know. Um, well, she did go down, what, 5-2, five, 5-1 five, in that first set and had to win in three. Mm -hmm. I mean, she came back and won those two sets easily. Right. I guess I'm just uh, relieved that it's not something serious because mm -hmm. you always get nervous about wrist injuries in tennis. But she, I mean, she beat Sasnovich in three sets. The second and third set were 6 11, 6 1. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, Angelique Kerber is one of the winningest players on grass active on the WTA tour. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a comfort zone for her if she's playing well. Yeah. Even before she won Wimbledon, this was a mm -hmm. very comfortable service for her. In the bottom half, we've got Shiantek versus An Shabur. Shiantek was a bit of a wild card coming into this tournament, not really knowing if she'd be able to to put it together on grass. But she's uh, <laughs> she's uh, leveling up on this surface. Yeah, I mean, she kind of underperformed at Roland Garros as the defending champion. She's one of these players like uh, like Sinner who is so young that they really don't have much experience on the surface. So it was hard to predict what would happen. But she gets through Begu, 6-1-6 love. She's going to face Jabour, who, uh, I mean, talk about momentum. She has the most match wins on tour this year, on mm -hmm. Jabour. Oh, really? I believe so. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I saw <laughs> that floating around on Twitter. <laughs> Let's hope that's right. She beat Venus Williams in the second round. Now, the Muguruza match, for me was the most exciting match of the first week just because you had everything. I mean, you had the quality, but there were also some intangibles that you really can't predict. Well, I guess if it's Ons, you can predict that there may be some vomit going on at some point in the match, but she's done this before. Okay. <laughs> really? No, really. No, I, I just wanted to make sure you had your facts right there <laughs> because that's a pretty bold thing to say. To me, this is this is the kind of matchup that I like to watch on grass. I want to see a huge hitter like Muguruza, a former champ, against Jabour, who is someone who can serve in volley, who is creative and a quick thinker out there. And it creates uh, just a drama that I... This is what I want to see on grass. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Jabur was warmed up by Venus Williams in the previous round, if that's the kind of play that you like, and if mm-hmm. that's the play that she'd have to deploy to beat Muguruza. Right. Now, of course, I would have rather seen Venus go further, but failing that, I love to see what Jabor is doing. Really, it, you know, it's taken her a few years to really capitalize on all the talent that she has, and this past probably 18 months she's been putting it together. She generated 29 break chances against Muguruza on grass. Like, that is crazy. Muguruza uh, saved, what, 25 of them? Twenty, Yeah, like 24 or 25 she saved, which is also amazing. But, uh, I mean, Jabor just had it in, in the third set. She really started to dominate in the third set. And it, uh, she didn't run away with it. It got a little bit tricky later on. She got to match point, goes to the back of the court, barfs. I mean, it wasn't just like a little barf. It wasn't a it wasn't a baby spit up. It was we a real one. We see enough barfing on TV, <laughs> yes. projectile barfing for you, for you to just avoid going okay. into too much detail. That here. is actually when the match became prestige television, because all prestige dramas have to have very graphic vomiting scenes. I know you've noticed. So she throws up. She comes back to the line. She loses her first match point, but then she gets a service winner and finishes out the match on her second match point. Look, in in this matchup here, we know that Svantec has this pedigree on clay. But she's also the 2018 Junior Wimbledon champion. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll go on to have a lot of success on grass. I don't even know that it necessarily means that you have prowess on grass as a professional. It's kind of, I feel like it's kind of a, a haphazard event for younger people (laughs) to win this tournament it's not necessarily a predictor Mm -hmm. past champions on the junior level include ash barty we know she can play on grass christina pliskova won as a junior laura robson agaradvanska won okay yeah Mm -hmm. former runner-up here benchich won benchich won the junior girls channel slam oh wow in 2013. Bouchard, also a former runner-up here. Ostapenko, semi-finalist. She won in 2014. I'm just wondering if it's a if it's a blind spot for us and other people to drone on about Sviantec's lack of grass success, not taking that into, mm. com- into account. Yeah, because we're only looking at professional results. Yeah. Or yeah. if that's stupid, does that really make any difference at this point? <laughs> I don't know. Other than maybe to call on some fond memories. Mm-hmm. So we mentioned Rybakina is into the fourth round here. She's going to play Sabalenka. Sabalenka is still looking for a slam quarterfinal. And her road has has not been easy. Taken to three sets by Katie Bolter. That Bolter match was one of the matches of the first week. Katie Bolter played really well. Yeah. And um, had that been a hard court maybe, the <laughs> Sabalenka could have... Oddly enough, hit through her more easily, I think. Mm. Uh, But Bolter clearly seemed comfortable on the grass and was able to get more purchase with with her shots. Mm -hmm. Sabalenka, again, is in a position where she can make her first quarterfinal. You know, we kind of, if not mock, adjacently mock her at times. And a lot of folks on Tennis Twitter do as well for her failure to take this next step. But she, she persists. She's not getting down on herself, losing belief in her ability to do it. She keeps giving herself opportunities. Yeah, and it doesn't really seem to be dependent on the draw because she's had good draws, bad draws. It just hasn't happened yet. I think it will. Mm -hmm. In Australia, she had the misfortune of drawing Serena Williams. Madison Keys. this is one that I would like to be right about. From our preview episode, I said that this section of the draw is a good opportunity for Madison to get to the semifinals. I'm just going to let that sit there as she takes on <laughs> yes. Golubich on Monday. <laughs> and Karolina Pliskova is back into the fourth round here, and she has to face someone who is absolutely on fire, Samsonova. Mm-hmm. Pliskova has not reached the quarterfinals here, but neither has Samsonova, so we shall see. At this point, Pliskova is a popular pick to lose early in every Grand Slam she plays, so this is a good result for her. Yeah, I did feel the shade on that, but I think 
she probably enjoys proving a few people wrong. I think she's shown that she just doesn't care, <laughs> which is something I actually really admire. That's true. I would like, I personally would like proving people wrong, but you're right. I don't think she cares. On the men's side, we told you that Novak Djokovic will play Christian Garin. The winner of that goes on to play either Marton Fucevic or Andrei Rublev. Yeah, lately it's been, you know, if you want to beat Djokovic, you should probably do it earlier rather than later. And he's just not had a extremely tough competition. You know, the draw was a little bit kind, which as the number one seed, it should be kind. But I don't see Garin doing it. <laughs> It's not that it it should be kind. It's that the players who could cause him trouble were not in his draw. Yeah, it's, and that's a very small number of yes, players. Yes, and that's why it's quote-unquote lucky or easy because there are players who could shake things up a little bit, give him a, <laughs> a tough match, but they're just not in his draw. Mm -hmm. At this point, if you get Djokovic to a tiebreaker, you've done a great job. Denis Shapovalov. Had to miss the French Open because of injury. That was kind of a shock pullout right before the tournament, if you recall. He's back on grass and in the second week. He lit Andy Murray's ass up in that third round. Yeah, I, I mean, Dennis played an excellent match. He was really professional. He really kept his head together. And he didn't. He wasn't trying to go for too much. I was really impressed with, with his performance. It was 4-2-2. Two but if you were to find one thing that was a little bit worrying or disappointing was that he had massive leads in every set. And in every mm -hmm. set, he gave back a little. Yeah. I mean, you expect somebody with the, again, the pedigree of... <laughs> Your favorite word. <laughs> ...of an Andy Murray to not lose love, love, and love. Like, he's gonna, he's gonna push back a little bit. But for it to happen in every set... Absolutely so still it progression. certainly wasn't a perfect match, no. but it was good under the circumstances on center court against someone who the crowd very, very much wants yes. to do well. He's going to play Roberto Bautista Agut. Don't count him out. He is the most recent semifinalist at Wimbledon. And RBA is a bugaboo. For Djokovic. You're looking way too it's ahead. It's way ahead. Way ahead. But, there. you know, when you're looking for people who challenge Djokovic, it's hard to find them, hmm. as per your earlier point. Look, you're you're inviting more one-star reviews from Novak fans. <laughs> Wait, I, I feel like I'm saying good things about him right now. No, you're talking about how the draw is so easy. No, there are not I mean, that many people who can all, beat him. All number one seeds get some luck every Listen, once in a James, while. You are not this is giving how... him enough credit. <laughs> he is the supreme talent. It's true. To finish that top half, Karen Hachanov plays Sebastian Cordo. At this point, it seems that the American men finally have a player who could be ready to break through into the truly upper echelons of the men's game. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, he is the U.S. number one right now. He knocked out Alex Diemenauer, who has been playing well on grass. He beat Dan Evans on center court in front of the English crowd. I mean, if it's not him for the U.S., who is it? It could have been Francis. It could have been. With a deep run here. This could. We wanted this so much to be a big breakthrough moment for him. Mm -hmm. As Daniel Medvedev is at the podium right now. Wow. Coming back from two sets to love against Marin Cilic. Is one of the, that was like a Djokovic comeback from two sets to love down because the opponent was Cilic. You kind of felt that <sighs> once Medvedev started to come back and got the lead in the third set that it was somewhat inevitable. Yeah. I am, uh, I'm kind of a closet Cilic fan. I really like him. And uh, I felt that he kind of had this one. I wasn't at all surprised that he went up two sets to love. But... I mean, this is also kind of his want sometimes. Uh, Matteo Berrettini, are we done with Corda? Yeah, I think that's all for now. Okay. Matteo Berrettini, popular pick to win this tournament, should Djokovic not be the, the chosen one. Mm -hmm. He's um, among several... Uh, He's one of three top favorites to win. Betting favorites right, as well. Right, right. He will face uh, Ivashka in the fourth round. Cute moment. Today, Berrettini won his match, and as he was leaving the court, he mouthed, 
or I mean mouth because I couldn't hear it, but he asked his box, what's the score? And the score he was asking about was his girlfriend Ayla Tomlanovich's score. And then it's reported that he was then seen scurrying, <laughs> running <laughs> across the grounds to get to that match. Mm-hmm. It was good news, by the way. Felix Ojeel Yassim beat Nikirios today in a retirement. He will face that guy from Germany, who beat Taylor Fritz today. Roger Federer. He's come through this section looking a lot better than I thought he would. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cam Nori has had a great year, and this was not an easy customer for a third round. Federer is through. I mean... It's almost like Roger kind of walked off the street and remembered who he was because his lead up was not that great. Like he wasn't feeling good. He lost to Felix. He was pissed off. He was angry. I actually felt like that was a good sign that he wasn't just satisfied with, oh, Felix is great. It's fine. No, he was actually mad. Federer is also a rhythm player. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why people talk about him as being such a beautiful player to watch is because of his rhythm and flow it's more that that's the key for him you know and so like once that clicks on it can progress rather quickly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is why i think for some people federer matches at wimbledon when he's rolling are kind of boring because it feels so routine like he's going to hold serve easily they're going to be low drama service games it's like he's playing on muscle memory Mm -hmm. Which is a great job to get if you can get it. It Pays very well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But he still has moments within these matches where he has lapses. Sure. He lost the third set to Cam Nori. Nori, of course, played well. Credit to him. But he's still not like, I hate to say it, but like Federer of old. Right. Do you remember back, this was probably like in 2011 or something, when Shanks started appearing Mm -hmm. in his game and people were apoplectic Mm -hmm. like they couldn't believe that Federer was not perfect and this is just a a function of getting older yes you're gonna have sets and matches where you're just you're not all there both karate kids are alive Shapovalov (laughs) will play Bautista and Lorenzo Sonego will play Federer yeah this is the match that we wanted to see when we saw the draw Urkacz will now play Daniil Medvedev Mm -hmm. And in that one, your guess is as good as mine. This next segment, we're going to talk about some of the moments from week one that stuck out to us. Some of them we may have already hinted at or touched on already. But before we do that, a couple notes about these round of 16 matchups. This is the first time in almost, well, in like more than 30 years that three Russian men have made the round of 16 at Wimbledon. Oh, wow. And it's also the first time that these three men have made the round of 16 at the same Grand Slam tournament. Medvedev, Rublev, and Hachanov. We've heard about this crop of Russian tennis players for a long time, but this is the first time that we've seen them put it all together at the same slam. And uh, we've also heard a lot about Canadian men's tennis and the promise of it. Of course, no Milos Raonic here, but... Felix and Dennis are both in the round of 16 as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about like some themes and also some matches that happened. The first thing, the grass has been a topic of conversation in large part because it ended Serena Williams' tournament. A spill she took early in her first round match caused her to get injured, and that was that. It ended Manorino's tournament, but because it's Manorino and not somebody of the stature of a Serena Williams or a Roger Federer doesn't get the same play. Right. So the grass, as you know, is very slippy. As the British say, I guess. Here we say slippery. It was funny to me to hear, like, grown people say slippy because it sounds like a little kid's word. Uh, But, uh, listen, the grass... But this also happened on the same day on back-to-back matches. Manorino went out and then Serena went out. Manorino was taking it to Roger Federer. Like, he was playing really well, Federer was in a spot of trouble, and Manorino slipped, got hurt, and that was all she wrote. So it was a little bit, you know, nobody knows what the outcome of the match would have been, regardless. But uh, unfortunately for Manorino, because he was playing so well. Mm -hmm. Slipping on grass happens every year. 
It happens early in the tournament more so than later in the tournament when the grass is mostly unused, unworn. Like, you don't see the brown patches at the baseline. Mm -hmm. And evidently with the roof, which is what happened in these two particular instances, with the roof, it creates a a wetter grass. Right. Uh, It contains the humidity on the grass. It all makes sense, right? When the roof is closed, the indoor area is very humid. And now, you know, we always have a lot of rain here. The roof is closed very frequently. Uh, For a lot of this tournament, it's an indoor tournament, which is supposedly against Wimbledon's tradition. But it's kind of like, well, this is what we need to do to get through the tournament. And so at this point, we are made to accept that there's a certain number of injuries that we are to just take as par for the course. To get through this tournament. The Wimbledon is going to sacrifice maybe a handful of players every year now. Because this is just the way it is. This is how we do business. Right. And And a lot of people wanted to know, like, is there something that Wimbledon can do to alleviate this problem? To make the working conditions safer? Jason Goodall went to great lengths on TV to tell us that, listen, this this is about players' movement. You need to learn how to how to move better mm-hmm. on grass. All England club member Jason Goodall, mm-hmm. he really went to bat for his club. Meanwhile, Serena Williams is a how many time champion at Wimbledon? A seven. And how many in doubles? I don't know. Olympic champion <laughs> right. on grass? Yeah, she doesn't know how to move. She knows how to crip walk on grass. That requires a lot of, of footwork mm-hmm. as well. Deft footwork. But I guess that slip was entirely her fault. Mm-hmm. I... You know, it's obviously something we don't fully understand because I think you have to be a player on grass to know, like, what is hazardous and what is not. People, like you said, people slip on grass every year. Every year since it was invented. I'm sure people slip on grass court tennis. It's just a matter of, like, how much is too much. If players are getting injured and having to retire from matches, is it... Uh, a problem that the tournament needs to address? Is it the pro- a problem that a player's council or a union should be addressing as a health and safety concern? Mm-hmm. This is what we've been talking about for many years. This is just something that uh, a player's association or player's council should be concerned about. And tennis historically has not. Right. And if this type of injury had happened to a Federer, would he have said something differently than what he came out and said afterward? Where he went on air and essentially said there's nothing that Wimbledon can do. Like, this is this is what happens. I have to deploy these, these split steps mm-hmm. that allow me to float and hovercraft <laughs> around the court better than everybody else. Like, of course there's something Wimbledon could do. They could have people break in the grass days before the tournament. Famously, they don't allow anyone to play on center court or court one before the tournament starts except for this one exhibition match, I think on the Saturday before the tournament starts on Monday. The grass is pristine when you get there. Is Uh, it any surprise that Federer takes this stance towing the company line, essentially? That seems to be his MO for most things. (laughs) And Andy Murray went down hard toward the end of his match against Atta in in the second round. It... I mean, for a second there, it looked like he was seriously hurt, but he got up and he won the match, but he looked to be in pain in the moment. And of course you wonder, when someone goes down, how much of it is shock? Or is it a serious injury? But unfortunately, in Serena Williams' first match against Sasnovich, she was already strapped on one leg. She, she went down, sort of jammed her leg, and hurt the other leg. And it was clear, you know, she got up, she was limping... She saw the trainer, she went down again, and that was that. Like, she could barely even walk. It was devastating to watch. Mm -hmm. Serena was playing excellent tennis up until this point. We were, I think everybody was sitting there watching and thinking, well, well, damn, this is very promising. Right. She had walked on court with this train, the sort of cape thing down her back, um, you know, it had all the trappings of a, a typical Serena Williams debut at a Grand Slam, showing off her new kit. She was playing against someone I think would have been a great matchup for her. And 
Serena's record in first rounds in majors obviously speaks for itself. She's the defending runner-up here twice over, and the predictions on what her tournament was going to be were a lot. You know, the, the odds makers put her as a favorite. A lot of fans expected that this was finally it. Like, See, I totally disagree. And I didn't, I mean, I don't like making predictions like that at all because you're bound to be disappointed. But it was it was a really good chance for her to go far. Sure. The odds makers are going to do what they're going to do. But I think most people at this point, after having lived through the entirety of Serena's comeback from maternity, know to take it match by match. Right. Like, I don't think there were runaway expectations for Serena Williams at this tournament. But because she came out looking so good, that makes it even more disappointing. Not just for us, but for her. You could see how devastated she was. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine all the work that you put in to get to this point, being away from home for months at this point, we didn't even know how long she was away from home for a while. Right, right. She and, was in Europe with the family for months training. And she's put in all this work, a lot of it behind the scenes that we don't see, only for this to happen. Coming after all the prior disappointments of losing in Grand Slam finals, of not being able to bring her best for whatever reason. And now she shows up and, and looks to be confident in good form and on her best surface, and this happens. I mean, it was it was a, a just a stunning thing to watch, and not in a good way. After a couple days, this has kind of... Folks have had a chance to digest it. We hear from Patrick Moratoglu. And where do we hear from him? We hear from him from his own outlet, Tennis Majors. <laughs> and the, type, the, the headline is... Quote, our exclusive with Patrick Moratoglu. Well, damn, if Tennis Majors isn't getting an exclusive with Patrick Moratoglu, who the hell is? <laughs> it's, well, first of all, no one's getting an exclusive because he's talking to everybody. But this is like uh, Fox News getting an exclusive with Rupert Murdoch. He owns the thing. It's, it's, it's wild. <laughs> he told us in that article that they left the site together. And from everything he said, it, it didn't give any indication that Serena was thinking about retiring. The only thing on her mind as they left the site was, well, what can we do to, to fix this, to come back, to, right. to do this again? So that, that, those are encouraging signs, at least. I mean, every time Serena sort of blows kisses to a crowd or thanks them or tears up on court, people want to say, is this it? And honestly, we don't know. But what we do know about Serena is that she is motivated by people doubting her, perhaps more than any player we've ever seen. Um, she likes to prove people wrong. And who knows? I would not be surprised to see her back here next year. Not a bit. One of the big stories of week one was Andy Murray's run to the third round. In his first match, he plays Basilashvili. I mean, not, not an easy match. Vasilashvili, much to our disdain, has been playing well in the last few months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's a top 30 player. And Andy Murray is without matches <laughs> at this point in yeah. his career. But he takes the first two sets and then goes up 5-love in the third. And then we all saw something that was beyond belief. Andy Murray coughing up seven straight games to lose that third set 7-5. Yeah. And at that point, having to close the roof because of darkness, that gave him a chance to kind of wheel and come again. Yeah, because it did not look good. The momentum was squarely with Basilashvili, but closed the roof, and Andy managed to gut out that fourth set. I mean, it wasn't... Like, Andy did not play pretty tennis here, really, in any of his matches, but you saw sparks of who he is. He had 17 aces in that match against Basilashvili, but the movement is obviously not where it was, and we don't expect it to be. But you saw a lot of kind of sliced forehands because he wasn't quite there. You know, he was sort of reaching on the forehand side, I noticed. But there is, there's really nothing. There's nothing in the sport that is quite like an Andy Murray match at Wimbledon with the fans and with his kind of psychodrama going on. Because, because he plays into it. He is 
he's the catalyst for it. Mm-hmm. Be it his ability to allow matches to swing in directions that are not in his favor, like we saw <laughs> right. in that third set. And then his ability to play off and with the crowd and to the crowd in those situations. Mm-hmm. And he's somebody who, I mean, he, throughout his career, has beaten himself up a lot. He screams a lot. He curses his box himself. There's, you know, there's a storm going on inside Andy Murray's head during a match. But he told the press this week that now he likes to pick out a few people from the crowd and sort of make it about them to sort of connect with them and find motivation. And uh, it's interesting because this is such an individual sport. You feel so alone out there that he manages to find kind of a human connection with somebody he doesn't know, and that grounds him in a match. Mm -hmm. In that second round match against Otto, he was up a set and a break, looked in good position, and then it all fell apart. Loses the second Mm -hmm. set, loses the third set, before eventually winning in five sets. Otto himself had come off a four-hour match in the first round, which he won in a a 13-12 tiebreak in the fifth set. One of Andy's last words in press was kind of a a self-reflective doubting moment. Him trying to weigh all the work that he put in to get to this point with what he was able to produce in that match against Denis Shapovalov. And we've seen this kind of gloom and doom, dour, sour Andy Moore in press before. Not, I mean, not often. Like, since his returns from surgery. I think or it's, leading into surgery mm-hmm. as well. Like, there, there's been a lot of... There's been some radical honesty. Yes. But, you know, right now he's expressing that... Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's worth it. Like, you wonder if all this work is worth it. Previously, you never got the sense that he didn't love the game and want to win really badly. I, th- I understand. That, that hasn't changed. Right. And no, what I'm saying is that I understand that fans are scared by this, but I think this is so normal. Like, yes. how could someone not feel that way? I mean, this is the type of stuff that most people would feel they just wouldn't say. Right. And he was kind of in a, a bad place, and he said it out loud this time. Check this. Someone, won't say their name or Twitter handle, did some, quote, research on Coco Goff's court assignments at Wimbledon in her career. And that research shows that to date... Through eight matches at Wimbledon, two fourth round appearances so far, that she's played three matches on center court, three on court one, and one on court two. And this has caused a lot of conversation. (laughs) Yeah, so let's say first that if you're looking at only her rank or her seed and the level of opponent, yeah, it's, it's surprising to see someone at that level play on the biggest courts so routinely. However... This is an entertainment event. Wimbledon wants to make money. Coco has been a superstar since at least 2019. Like, it's honestly as simple as that. She has name recognition outside of tennis, apparently in the UK as well, because that's why they're putting her on the biggest courts. What people are trying to do here is break down whether she deserves this attention. Mm -hmm. Right? And that is so seedy to me. Because time and again... We see this stuff framed as, well, this didn't happen for Venus and Serena. What has she done to deserve this kind of attention? Part of it is a media creation. And at this point, it is what it is. She's also delivered the goods for a then 15-year-old and a now 17-year-old. She's actually handled the stage and the pressure incredibly well. Mm -hmm. We actually don't talk about Coco a lot. On this podcast for a reason. Yes. Because we've tried not to feed into that machine that can chew up and spit people out. Because we've seen what it can do to other young players, especially women. And we also know what it does to young black women. Yeah. Young black girls. Oh no, we're getting there. Yeah. Think about it. Like, why Why do you think she's on the biggest courts? Because she attracts attention. Like, they want to sell tickets and they want TV ratings. Period. That's it. And the fact that Venus should be on bigger courts is an important point, but it's a separate point. Same for Angelique Kerber, if you want to make that argument, a separate point. And we're talking about a young black girl in tennis. I'm sorry if white people 
in the same position don't get the same attention. Like, That's just the what? state of the union. <laughs> just don't come for Coco about this because she didn't ask for these courts. She's being put there for a reason because people talk about her. And it's the same thing with Naomi. I'm sorry that the biggest stars in this sport are black. I, I mean, do you want an apology? And by sorry, you mean what exactly? I'm not sorry. <laughs> That's just how it is. The but thing what, is, uh, like, there are far more accomplished players who don't attract that kind of attention. And is that unfair? Maybe. But these tournaments, they don't care. They want to make money. Time and again, we say you can't talk about black tennis players without considering their blackness. Like, this is another instance. And by the same token, you can't go out there and make your spreadsheets and make all these arguments without taking that into consideration as well. I just, I find it gross that there there is like a class of people out there who disproportionately find fault with young black girls who play tennis. Like, it, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, resentment, and I don't know where it comes from. Some of it comes from them having it, quote-unquote, easier than Serena and Venus. Which, hello, progress. Yeah, well, that's one thing, yeah. But there's another uglier side of it that I don't really want to move into the light. But I'm just going to say, as we've said many times before, don't use Venus as your shield. Don't, don't say you love Venus because she's good and she's kind and she's graceful. Or classy. Classy. Just don't. If you're going to say it, stand in it. Mm -hmm. Because for a long time, we saw folks hate Serena but like Venus. And why mm -hmm. was that? I, I mean, obviously, you don't have to be a fan of both. But but let's be honest about what's going on here with Coco. Well, there we went, race baiting again. <laughs> <laughs> it's what you've come to expect. On to um, maybe greener pastures. Ash Barty played Carla Suarez Navarro in the first round. Carla played Sloan at Roland Garros to no crowd, unfortunately, and gave her quite a fight. Carla is coming back from treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma. She lost to Ash, but this time she she actually got um, an ovation. You know, she got to be appreciated by the fans. Mm. You were doing a lot there with your setup, saying that Carla went on to greener past that we were going on to greener pastures oh. with Carla's retirement, the fact that it's on center court. Well, grass court. <laughs> I mean, oh, I didn't even mean all that. That was it was just a figure of speech. Sad that Carla is retiring and that, you know, she was crying in press afterward. But it's it's a lot. It's a very emotional thing. And, uh, you know, she is a very accomplished player. And I, I hope people talk about her like that. This isn't just a feel good story. Mm -hmm. This is a, a very, very good career here and a very skilled tennis player. My favorite moment of week one was... Venus Williams and Nick Kyrgios playing mixed doubles together. That was so much fun to watch. And unfortunately, that is now in jeopardy because Kyrgios suffered an abdominal injury in his third round match against Felix Ojeale Sim. He had to retire from that match. Mm -hmm. And now, who knows if two days is going to be enough for him to get himself in a, a decent enough physical state to play mixed doubles with Venus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and this, so this is just like so emblematic of how we can't have anything good right <laughs> really okay so the first week it was rough after serena's retirement but the venus nick mixed doubles match was an absolute blast it was so much fun nick was bigging up venus non-stop after every point it was good job v nice shot v yeah. He was he was doing the most as he always does which he does yeah it was it was a bit much for me with the like as if he's like the wind beneath her wings. Like, get a grip here. Dude. No, but it, despite Nick's uh, flaws, I appreciate how much he admires Venus and Serena, how much he honors the people who have come before. It, it's a really, it's an endearing part of him. And because he's Nick, he's doing a lot all the time. He's chattering constantly. So mixed doubles is maybe a good venue for him. The best player on that court that day was Sabrina Santamaria. She may only have a first serve that barely tops 75 miles an hour, but she can hit every shot on the court, and she was playing out of her mind <laughs> yes. in that match. She rarely misses. She was clearly enjoying herself out there. And the the williams Kyrios matchup lacked in doubles tactics. It's mm -hmm. like, like Venus is a, obviously one of the great doubles players 
literally ever. But Nick was, uh, they hadn't worked it out as a team, right? If they do go on to play some more, they need to work on their lobs. Because both of them, save for that backhand lob winner that Venus hit, which was kind of a shank, a fortuitous (laughs) one. But still, the lob situation is something that you have to have under control as a doubles player. Yeah, yeah. But if they go up against a team like they are meant to face next, if they do face them, they're going to need to work out the doubles tactics a lot better. Mm -hmm. Because Nick, uh, you know, in his enthusiasm, kind of stepped on Venus a few times, like gets poaches things that maybe he probably shouldn't have tried or, you know, it was it was exciting, no doubt. But it was probably not like the best doubles you've ever seen. No. Venus won her first match against Buzarnescu. Won in three sets, saved 13 of 15 break points, had double digit aces. You have those stats in your brain, huh? Because you didn't write that down. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was encouraging. But who was next? Ons Jabur. Yeah. One of the winningest players on tour this year, somebody with incredible momentum, just coming off her first career title, winning on grass in the lead up to Wimbledon. Not ideal. And had she had gotten through that match, she'd have had to play Garbinia Muguruza, which would have been a rematch of the 2017 Wimbledon final. Instead, what we got was a reoccurrence of the same scoreline from that final in the second round. I felt it developing right from the back end of that second set. You could tell the momentum had switched. Mm-hmm. Once Venus had gotten the break back, had gone back up 5-4, I believe, and then didn't win another game. Yeah, Just like what happened in that Wimbledon final. It was tough to watch, but for a match and a, a match and a half, we got Venus playing solid, good grass court tennis, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, Onsjabur played incredible tennis, especially when she figured out what she, what she needed to do on that court. But at the same time, Venus just started spraying errors all over the place. The forehand was a complete mess in that match. Yeah. The forehand was actually much better in the mixed doubles match. Mm-hmm. But at least she got some matches. And at least there was a prospect of her having fun, which she seemed to have a lot of fun in that mixed doubles first round, and get some more matches with Kyrgios. But yet again, we cannot have. <laughs> we cannot have well, nice things. Well, and the Williams sisters evidently cannot have nice things at this point in their career. So Nick has not officially pulled out as of this recording. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with mixed doubles. He played Felix Ojeel Yassim. He had a lot of lovely things to say about Felix ahead of their match today. And uh, I guess he didn't hear maybe what Felix said about him a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> about not being someone he would consider being friends with uh, because of his character. Maybe it was kind of an assassination. Maybe they have discussed it and have moved on, or maybe Nick heard it and it's water under the bridge. Who knows? Or maybe he hasn't heard it yet and there's fireworks to I come. I don't know. Regardless, Nick uh, clearly has a lot of respect for Felix. And I mean, he broke him three times in the first set, he was outplaying Felix completely. And uh, late in that first set is when he suffered this acute kind of abdominal or hip injury. He got treatment. He was kind of waving at the waving at the camera while he was getting treatment. It was a lot of fun and games, but he did tell the trainer, like, I can't. I'm going to finish the set and that's it. It was clear in the second set that the match was over. But uh, Felix is definitely going to have to bring up that level if he wants to continue because the nerves really got the better of him in this match. I'm just sitting here crossing off a bunch of stuff that we still have on the agenda. Oh, that we're we're not going to have time for. No, and saving them for our rap show. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, All eyes were on Yelena Ostapenko going into this tournament because she is a former semifinalist here. She just won Eastbourne. She's she's kind of been on fire. She played Dasha Kazatkina. Well, in in this match, she set herself on fire. (laughs) (laughs) So let's go back a day. Uh, in the second round, she played Dasha Kazatkina. Historically, they've had some tension between them. You didn't really see it in this match. Like, they're older. One of them has grown up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is one of those matches that I feel is polarizing among WTA fans because I hated it. But there's definitely a group of folks who 
live for this stuff. And it's it's just as valid. I am just, it was, it's not my fave. Like there were 11 breaks of serve in the third set. To me, it felt like, okay, somebody's just got to like put it together and win because this is ugly. And, and other people love it. Okay, and we, it's we, fine. We talk about this privately all the time. Like you need to get over the break of serve thing. <laughs> Like, that is okay, a character flaw on your part. On grass? 11? <laughs> Fair. Ele- okay, okay. 11 out okay. of 14 games? I mean, I'm not mad at breaks of surf, but, like, at some point, if you want to win, you got to hold. Sure, but it's a fact. It's a known fact <laughs> yes. that women don't have as big a serve as men. Like, that's just the way it is. Of course. and So, uh, like, this whole, like, anti-holding thing necessarily... Is used by some to put down women's tennis. I think you're doing a lot right now because I'm not somebody who goes on about breaks of serve all the time. Privately, you do. This is like the third time we've talked about it this week for different matches. Oh, well, just expose me then. (laughs) Isn't it? No, but that... Sometimes, you know me, sometimes I go on a tangent. (laughs) That doesn't mean I'm right. Look, I agree with you when it's my fave and my fave can't hold. (laughs) Like, that shit's annoying as hell, right? Mm. But if no. it's people I don't really business about, like, Listen, let them have it. On on the women's side, the return game is more evolved. Yes. Period. We've heard coaches of men and women say the same thing. That's that. The return game is at a very high level mm-hmm. on the women's side. But for my fave, Dasha Kazatkina, if you're going to spin second serves like that, you're not going to win this match. Like, she served for it two times, lost both times. And Ostapenko was able to win this match. Okay, but so won. move on to what happened today. That's now, where today, the juice is. Of course, today all eyes were on Tomlanovich Ostapenko. Tomlanovich is up for love in the third set. Ostapenko takes a medical timeout for an acute injury, disappears for a good three or four hours. This is before I mean, Tomlanovich is set to serve. Yeah. So she was already keyed up about the timing of the medical timeout. Mind you, acute means it's new. It just happened. Mm-hmm. It's not like a chronic thing. If if you are, you know, working in good faith, you assume that Ostapenko suffered an injury during the match and needed treatment at that time. Tamlanovich was not of that opinion. Right, but this is where something can actually be done, right? There's this kind of spirit of the game, unspoken rule, whereby you do not take a medical timeout right before somebody's supposed to serve. Just simply mm-hmm. say, fine, if this happens to you, you may just have to, in effect, sacrifice a game. Right. You might just have to stand there and walk from side to side and then get treatment. Now, Isla, in front of everybody, said to the umpire, you know she's lying, right? We all know. <laughs> I mean, all, it was a small court. All the fans heard, TV heard. She was pissed off. I want somebody to save that energy for Yastremska when she comes back. <laughs> Maybe we'll see that in Hamburg next week. <laughs> And so this medical timeout, it, it you know, did not allow Ostapenko to get back in the match. No. Tamlanovich won the third set. And, of course, everybody's waiting for the handshake. They get to the net and Tamlanovich said, cold as ice. I hope you feel better. No, no, that was in response mm-hmm. to Ostapenko telling her, look, if you don't believe me, you can talk to the trainer. She can tell you. You're very disrespectful. <laughs> and then she oh, was just like, I hope God. you feel better. Mm-hmm. And it went back and forth, and, and Tomlanovic said, well, you're one to talk about being disrespectful. Mm-hmm. And they uh, they went at it in press. They, yeah, it, it went on and on. And honestly, Yelena has some points, right? As a rule, we, as in you and I, generally don't question a player's injuries unless it's this repeated pattern of gamesmanship at really inopportune moments. If someone says they suffer an acute injury on court, we tend to believe them. Mm-hmm. The thing is, Ostomenko went on and on and on about being respectful on court, and she is just not the conduit. No, it's she just, is... This is a the boy who cried wolf phenomenon. Objectively, one of the most disrespectful players that has ever played the game. Well, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's not go that far, please. I don't think that she's a bad person. No. I just think that her lecturing someone about respect is... Just a, the tiniest bit rich. Precious. Yeah. Way back earlier this week, Benoit Pair was playing a first round against Diego Schwartzman, and Benoit was given a code violation for lack of effort. We've seen this kind of behavior from him 
all year. Last year, he's won very few matches since the return. He is miserable in the bubble restrictions. A fan actually yelled out, quote, you're wasting everybody's time. A little mean, but uh, Benoit is doing the most. Every tournament, it's the same thing. And by most, and you mean the least. The le- it, It's like, it really feels like dealing with a toddler at this point. Like, he's incorrigible, he complains, he throws tantrums, he doesn't try. Why are you here? Is it just that he can't go to party at these I, tournaments? I don't know. Like, we've said before, it is very understandable if somebody is made miserable by these working conditions. You know, this is not easy, but you're also not being forced to do this. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. other players are out here. Diego's out here trying his best, and you're kind of making a mockery of the whole thing. Well, we also see other players making mature adult decisions for their careers. Mm-hmm. Saying, well, I'm not going to play the Olympics because I don't want to go through all that for whatever reason. I'm going to take some time off like Shapovalov did because I need a break from this bubble life. You like, know? if you need the help, you got to find it at some point. I mean, the interesting thing is I made this flippant joke a few weeks ago when the ATP severely uh, reduced their bubble restrictions that, well, what is Benoit going to complain about now? Well, he's still going to complain about the bubble. The bubble is like, is really not what it was, but he's still complaining about the bubble. Mm -hmm. Brad Gilbert went in. He went hard on pair saying that the ATP has missed the boat here and should have been like punishing him months ago and that Benoit should be embarrassed at his own behavior. This that could be the ATP's tagline. We miss the boat. <laughs> Always. <laughs> we talk a lot on these shows, especially at Grand Slams, about some of the failings of commentary and mm. certain commentators. I do think it's maybe not important, but good to talk about some of the times when it goes right. Yeah. And it helps when it goes right with people that you don't find objectionable say if boris becker had been right that would have been a difficult (laughs) pill to swallow but it would have been only fair to i mean we don't get boris very often on our tv in canada it's very rare but i think what you're talking about is chris fowler and brad gilbert uh actually mentioning the accusations against alexander zverev right this was in the basilashvili murray match in the first round and time and again we have either basilashvili or zverev on court And the commentators refer to what they allegedly did with euphemisms by beating around the bush. In the case of John McEnroe, who is a repeat offender with this, framing the allegations against them as some difficulty that they have to overcome to further their career and win. Just one more obstacle in the steeplechase of their career (laughs) or season. (laughs) Steeplechase. But in, wait, it's track season. Mm-hmm. It's okay. track season. Yep. In this instance, Chris Fowler and Brad Gilbert did this one two step, this tandem description and takedown of the ATP for how they've handled it with precision, not beating around the bush, just telling it like it actually is. So Fowler goes through everything that has happened with Basilej Feeling. And then Brad chimes in and pivots to say that, you know, similar accusations have been made against Verev and the ATP has failed to deal with this properly. And he goes on to say that the ATP needs to do better and they need to fix their bylaws ASAP. Mm -hmm. Brad was on one that day. But in seriousness, this is all that we wanted. Yeah. We wanted commentators to talk us through the facts of the matter. And Chris and Brad didn't say that this person is an abuser or this person did this. They took you through the facts of what happened. Yeah. They said Basilashvili is standing trial for alleged abuse against his ex-spouse. Alexander Zverev has been accused of such and such. We're not asking for a character assassination, but we just want the truth. And they, right? But the important part here is I feel like Andy Murray gave them the, the voice to be able to mm-hmm. talk about of this course. in this way. Because 
they said what they said, and then because Basilashvili was playing Murray, they then say, and Andy Murray had something to say about to impress, saying that the ATP doesn't have anything on the mm-hmm. books to deal with this, and they should. And that then gave them license to then pivot further. Right, because it is news. Even though this stuff happened off the tennis court, this is news. It's pertinent mm-hmm. to the match. We just gave some praise. We are going to do the opposite here with Alexandra Stevenson because she had an absolute dumpster fire of a segment where it felt like a Tom Rinaldi vignette praising so, Margaret Court in effect just for being nice to her. For some reason, Alexandra got on this tangent about how I know Margaret gets a lot of hate, dot dot dot, but... She was really nice to me this one time. She was very generous. Like, what is she talking about? Like, what is the point of doing this? Who cares? Who cares? What? Wait, but wait. Rewind. What does she get a lot of hate for? If, let's be precise here. What are you talking about? I love how you're just like piggybacking off of my intellectual property (laughs) and presenting them as if it's your own. (laughs) To quote Candy Burris, why don't you piggyback the fuck up? (laughs) Is that what you wanted to tell me? (laughs) <laughs> it, we steal each other's IP all the time. I think we're allowed. Um, but we are both right. <laughs> um, but you were right it, first. What is it that she gets a lot of hate for? Tell us, Alexandra. We want to Tell know. Tell us that it's the fact that she was quoted in print back in the 70s and early 80s as being pro-apartheid. Saying it's not that bad. Be- maybe they're onto something in South Africa. Not only is it not bad, it's actually an ideal situation. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they're onto something. And then to spend the majority of her adult life campaigning against LGBTQIA folks. Like, this is not an understatement. Because it's not just that she has her church and she is entitled to her opinion. You know, that's the pushback all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Margaret Court's opinions in her mind are actionable thank you they have real world consequences not just in how what she says is received by people who may be hurt by what she says but she tried to legislate have her voice be an important one to legislate against gay marriage in australia and And she was out here talking all types of shit about casey delacqua's family right not only legislate against same-sex marriage in theory, but decided to make it extremely personal about one person's family. Mm -hmm. So when you come into this studio to sit down and talk about, I know she gets a lot of hate, I need you to to talk up, to tell me what exactly it is that she gets a lot of hate for. Because there are a lot of women in tennis, your elders, your predecessors, who are very knowledgeable and have a lot of experience with Miss Margaret Court in this in this matter. Yes, and they simply do not F with her. I've been swearing a lot, so I censored myself mm-hmm. on that one. But, like, this is not just an Alexandra. Like, what were the producers thinking? Yeah. Like, this is a failure on so many levels. Yes, but it also is an Alexandra thing. For a while, I know, like, on Twitter, she is uh, a target, you know. Not that she's a target on Twitter on her own Twitter. No, no. But that on but Twitter people talk People about like to her. make fun of her and yeah. say she's terrible and whatever. And for a while, I was just chill with Alexandra. Like, it was just vibes. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel she was the best commentator. I didn't feel like she was seriously objectionable. It was just um, interesting. There were a lot of ebbs and flows. A right. lot of above average stuff and a lot of bad stuff. This was just... And some... a, lot, a lot of laughs, to be honest. Yeah. The laughs made up for a lot of yeah. it. This is just, like, bizarro stuff. This is a breaking point. This is a tipping point. This is endgame for me. Like, I'm done. Oh, Oh, okay. Like, I do... I'm tired of straight people telling me how hateful anti-gay people should be received by queer people. Like, I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. Stop making excuses for these people. Like, what is is your horse in this race, Alexandra? What is it to Mm -hmm. you to be doing all of this? To get another invitation... To a tea party? Like, send her a thank you note next time. Keep it off air. We've gotten through the uh, the Wimbledon week one topics that we wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. We're going to shift a bunch to uh, the next episode. We have four things that we're shifting. 
that Roger Federer Rolex commercial. Uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> Olympic that, stuff. That's all you. Uh, more PTPA stuff. And then the schedule. Changes have been made to the schedule. Yes, the fall schedule. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you to those who have purchased BodyServe merchandise. We are uh, so thankful. We've loved seeing some messages and tweets and Insta stories come in with y'all wearing, showing us the merchandise, magnets on fridges, t-shirts. We got a pair of tank tops out on the tennis court. Mm-hmm. We have a bit of data now uh, with because we, we don't know who buys what, but we know what's bought. And so we know what the popular items are. Some of the most popular items, tank tops, t-shirts, mugs, tote bags, stickers, and my something I'm very happy about, the aprons. Folks are are buying body serve aprons. They'll be cooking with us. Mm-hmm. I thank you because I have a litany of song lyrics that I can use to promote the apron. Oh. Yeah. Such as? Yes, I do the cooking. Yes, I do the cleaning. And? And... I'm uh, challenging you to oh, this litany uh, here. All up in the kitchen in my heels, dinner time. Mm-hmm. What about cater to you? Is there something from cater to you I'm that sure you can like, put the apron on and cook me dinner or something? <laughs> Baby, Excuse this is your me. day. I, I do believe that cater to you was very recently canceled. <laughs> <laughs> about 17 years too late. <laughs> I understand that it's a reach for folks to buy a body serve clock. <laughs> but I'm partial to the clock. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. Um, but I, I love the clock. I also love the graphic t-shirt. Mm-hmm. I love the mug because you know I can't pass up a mug. We got a little mug tree in here, which you bought me to encourage me to get rid of old ones. But I just <laughs> add them. Uh, that was probably your most lasting well your only contribution to the design of the merchandise was the mugs yes i was like can you please go through and give me suggestions tell me what you don't like and you're like well i don't know if i like this mug Mm -hmm. i I placed the logo and i'm i'm just not very good with colors so i don't i'm not good Mm -hmm. at input here i also love the apron and because there are things that i feel are useful i'm extremely messy in the kitchen so love the apron love coffee love the mug there, there you have it. We are working on the tech stuff that is getting text on t-shirts oh, and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's something I'll look into in the next couple of weeks once Wimbledon dies down. In the meantime, if you have any suggestions for stuff that we have said or stuff that would be funny to put on a t-shirt, a quote that's applicable to what we've said or stuff we've talked about, let us know. So thanks again for everyone who has bought merch. And thank you for listening to our uh, mid-Wimbledon recap. Mm -hmm. I'm James. I'm at Elliot JMR on Twitter. Two L's, two T's. I'm Jonathan at Tennis underscore John. We're at The Body Serve on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find us on Spotify, Overcast, and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. If you want to buy merch, go to redbubble.com, search The Body Serve. You can find a link on our Instagram, on The Body Serve Twitter, as well as my personal twitter it's my pinned tweet Mm -hmm. thanks for listening till next time thank you very much